Welcome to this DW Business Special. I'm Rob Watts in Berlin, and today we're asking if Europe is de-industrializing. European factories have been shutting down furnaces and keeping production to a minimum. Why? Because of the soaring cost of energy. The war in Ukraine has driven up the prices of oil and gas, and energy-intensive industries are the first to feel the pinch. With no end in sight for Europe's power problems, could a phase-out of factories be on the cards? Well, to answer that question and many more, I'm joined by Maria de Mertzis, the Deputy Director of Brussels-based economic think tank <laughs> Bruegel. Maria, welcome to the programme. And just to kick straight off, um, what do we mean when we talk about deindustrialization? Well, as the term may suggest, it means that the, the industries, particularly the big industries, manufacturing, play a, a bigger, a, 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 actually a smaller role in the economy. And I think when people talk about that process, they, they typically refer to industry as reducing the amount of people it employs. So it's more of a labor in the industrialization rather than the contribution of the industries in the economy in general. Is there also an aspect to it about, you know, economies producing less of the raw materials that they use as well? Well, the, the industry actually uses raw materials to produce a particular good. So we import typically the raw materials uh, from elsewhere, as Europe does not really have raw materials, and we use those uh, uh, to produce manufacturing or other things. And one of the biggest one uh, is, of course, energy, which, of course, at the moment is particularly problematic. Well, I think just to understand how significant deindustrialization would be for Europe, it's worth to just look at how big a role uh, it plays in uh, European economies. And a good way to do that is by looking at what percentage of gross domestic product comes from industry currently. Firstly, in Europe's industrial powerhouse, Germany, it makes up over a fifth. That's above the average for the EU of 16.5 percent. And over in the US, industry makes up a smaller share of GDP than it does in Europe. Meanwhile, in the UK, which has shared much of its industry, Industry, uh, it now accounts for just a tenth of GDP. So, Maria de Mertzis, is industry uh, too big a part of the European economic system to be lost? Well, ab absolutely. I think if, if the industry were going to disappear, that would be, a, as, as your numbers show, uh, that, that would be a big hit for the European economy. But I think the process of the industrialization is not one of, of disappearing, make the industry disappear. It's, it's more about shares. Uh, new industries need to come in. I'm thinking in particular of the digital uh, part of the, of the economy. As they come in, they also claim parts of the shares of the economy. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the big manufacturing in Europe will disappear. It's just that the shares will be replaced. Right. So if, if industry does go, you talk about um, digitalization, for example, being something that would replace it. But, but are there other sectors that would also have to, to step in as well? Well, I think the one big issue that needs to be resolved still is how we're going to green the economy. And, and, and no doubt many industries, and no doubt also new industries, will have to come in and, and contribute to the, uh, to the growth of the economy and actually help us achieve the very ambitious re uh, objectives that we have for 2050. So I think the, the issue here is how we're going to green uh, our industries and what types of new industries do we need to create in order for economy to, uh, to continue to thrive. The current reduction in industrial activity, particularly in places like Germany, was not planned. It's quite sudden. It's a result of, you know, what's been happening in Ukraine and with relations with Russia. So can those other sectors that would need to step in to replace industry, can they, can they do that quickly enough? Well, I think we need to differentiate between what's going on now in the very short term and the longer term, the longer terms. Uh, I think deindustrialization is, is a process of a longer ter term trends. What is happening now is a reaction to the inability to meet our energy needs. Uh, the issues that you refer to uh, have to do with the fact that the energy bill is too high, but also for the, with the fact that we need to reduce our energy consumption uh, in next winter, otherwise we won't meet, uh, we don't have enough energy to go around. So the industry that is shutting out right now is simply because it cannot continue, not because uh, there is some underlying trend that implies that in the long run it will not survive. So I think we need to differentiate the two and deal with the two very differently. Okay, well, let's deal firstly then with the, with the near term and let's get an idea of the pressure that's facing European industry right now. Here's what the heads of some of the continent's manufacturers have had to say about the current state of play. 
Between January 2021 and January 2023, the price of electricity will have been multiplied by 22 and gas by 18. In these conditions, our production lines are worthless. If we maintain production, our energy costs could represent up to 40% of our turnover, which is untenable. I think we urgently need a Europe-wide industrial electricity price that would stabilize the situation for our industry. But of course, that's not something you can develop and roll out within a couple of weeks, so it's not going to work unless there's emergency aid. Actually, up to now, there's been no support at all from the state. We've applied for support for the high energy prices, but the application was extremely bureaucratic and it almost seems as if obstacles were being deliberately put in the way so that as few companies as possible could receive support. Maria de Mertz, is, uh, we heard industry leaders there complaining that they're not getting enough help. I mean, if we have this longer term trend of deindustrialization, is it really in the interest of governments now to step in and try to prevent this shorter term thing that we are seeing? Well, I think, yes, uh, in some way it is, because uh, uh, if we don't find a ways of the current industry to uh, to maintain, we are going to kill otherwise productive firms. And, and that's not how you generate, how, that's not how you diversify your industry. Um, I think what we've heard in the in the, in the the little comments, uh, it has to do with the fact that the energy bill is so high that the ener the current industry cannot meet uh, its, uh, its energy needs and it cannot pay for the bill. Um, there are many ways of helping uh, an industry in the current juncture, including uh, by changing the way that energy is priced. Now, as we correctly heard also, this is not something that we could do uh, immediately. However, I think there is emergency measures that the European Commission and others are thinking about to try and help uh, companies uh, sustain the energy crisis as we see today. Part of it will necessarily have to be of direct support to the firms. But how we do this exactly, of course, remains to be seen. I remind you also that we just come out of the pandemic where exactly the same needs arose there. Um, the countries, all countries in the European Union raised up to the occasion and actually helped industry uh, in order not to go bankrupt. Now, it is true also that the help that still countries uh, have at hand, namely the fiscal means to do so, is now reduced. But in any case, I'm sure that there will be ways of helping industry to, uh, to at least survive in the next year or so. Yeah, and, and the way that that should be approached is by going directly to industry and trying to, to help them out? Or is it a broader energy policy that needs to be introduced across Europe? Well, we're having both. So we have, and, and, but my view is that uh, the more targeted the help is, the better, uh, better it is because it reaches the needy. When it comes to the households, for example, it really is the uh, the, the the households that, that represent the low-income households that require more help with meeting the energy bills. And when it comes to firms, also not all firms have been hit uh, the same way. As you had said earlier on, the energy-intensive firms have been hit very high uh, right now because the, the energy bill, obviously, for them is exhausted. And therefore, targeting that support is always very helpful. Now, there's a trade off here. If you want to do it quickly, then it's easier to just give everybody something. Uh, but if you want to do it well, then you need to take the time and find out who is the one who needs uh, the, the help uh, the most and then target it appropriately. Okay, Maria, I'll be back with you in a moment. But there are those arguing that keeping industry alive when it's no longer cost effective is a waste of time and resources. Here's the view of Christian Bayer, an economics professor at the University of Bonn here in Germany. In a situation like this winter, where we have a shortage of resources, it makes no sense to keep energy intensive industries artificially in production. Quite simply because energy is extremely scarce. Therefore, it makes sense to do without energy intensive production right now, because the energy is needed more urgently elsewhere. Maria, is part of the problem for industry that when you've got problems like you know, very high inflation, very high energy bills, that actually they're not that high up the priority list for governments, particularly when households are suffering? 
Well, that was, uh, there is um, some truth in that. Uh, however, I think it's important that we sustain the industries because they are the ones who employ uh, uh, the uh, the households. In any case, uh, you know, we need to find ways of protecting the the fiber of the economy. Otherwise, there's going to be erosions that will be very difficult to regenerate afterwards. So that, there are balances to be struck here, and there are measures of taxing those who have made exorbitant profits during the energy crisis and use those funds to redistribute to those that more that need it both households as well as firms that are actually essential for the productive fibre of the economy. But is what you're arguing that actually taking money from industry to ease the problems elsewhere in the economy? Well, actually, I think there are industries that, uh, on the energy side, actually, that have made exorbitant profits during this crisis, simply because there are particularities in the way that energy prices are being uh, dictated. Uh, and, and there is a lot of talk and a lot of sympathy for taxing those exorbitant profits and use those funds to help those firms that actually have suffered during the energy crisis and indeed households. Right. Yeah. So, so any, any aid to... Um, industry and, and indeed any, not, I suppose the opposite of aid, but, but taking money from industry it needs to be targeted and needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Maria, I'll be back with you again in a second. One of the problems, as I've just mentioned, facing manufacturers in places like Germany is that they're not the government's priority when it comes to energy. So if you take a look at this chart of Germany's energy distribution, you can see that German households, transport as well, and services all need a lot of energy too. The most energy-intensive industrial sectors are particularly vulnerable to high energy prices. The ones listed here account for three quarters of Germany's industrial energy usage. So, Maria de Metzis, that's the situation in Germany. But are some European countries better positioned to weather this assault on the continent's energy intensive industries than others? <laughs> Certainly in terms of meeting the energy demands, uh, simply because uh, the uh, the energy is generated differently in different countries. Those who rely a lot on gas, no doubt, uh, are suffering right now because gas prices are exorbitant. Others who have a better uh, a more diversified energy mix it can actually meet the energy demands. However, I will say that the price of energy is a, a rather bizarre animal that is being uh, formed in European markets. And that, of course, means that all countries uh, face very high prices, irrespective of how energy is being uh, generated. So in that respect, uh, everybody suffers. Uh, the difference is on the quantities, not on the price. Is this an example of, of Germany missing out because of its over-reliance on Russian energy for the past decade? Well, I think the energy mix says it all. I think when you put all your eggs in one basket, uh, then, then you become vulnerable to that basket breaking. I think it's uh, uh, the one thing that we learned from the current uh, crisis is that diversification, is, uh, including in energy uh, sources, is absolutely essential. And that, of course, is something that we will fix. It's just that we can't do it immediately. So that's the short term. As we said, we need to differentiate between deindustrialization in the short term and in the long term. We're clearly seeing some short term effects, but are we on the route to Europe deindustrializing or at least industry playing a significantly smaller role in Europe's economy? <laughs> Well, I think the, let's start with uh, the issue of energy, because I think that is going to be the one thing to solve uh, uh, rather urgently. And no doubt we will need new technologies, uh, we will need new ways of uh, creating energies that are clean. They will contribute to the uh, industrial fabric of the economy and they will replace mm -hmm. other industries that will become obsolete. So that is the first thing to do. Uh, then, of course, there is other uh, trends that are going on. We talked about them earlier, the issue of digitalization, for example. Digitalization is absolutely essential and there is one way to, tra to travel, that is more dig digitalization in non-industries. And that, of course, requires new industry being created. Now, again, uh, how well Europe will manage to get into this uh, wagon of uh, digitalization uh, depends on many things, including finance. Uh, but I think that the term deindustrialization is perhaps not fair to the to the fact that new industries will have to be created and and they will be part of a new industry that is greener more digital um, and and actually quite different from the heavy industry that we knew from uh, from the past uh, all of this is uh, in the process of happening uh, and and that's why I think I will uh, the you know the jury is still out as whether that inquire requires deindustrialization or simply a different industrialization 
I think what people might be wondering, and certainly I, I, I'm wondering, is if Europe relies less on its own industry and presumably the industry of elsewhere in the world. We saw the frailties of global supply chains during the course of the pandemic. You know, what happens in one country can have a huge impact on what happens on the product in terms of production elsewhere. So how do you square the idea of deindustrializing Europe, as we're phrasing it, uh, with that problem, with the fact that global supply chains, uh, you know, offshoring is actually uh, something that over the last couple of years we've learned is not necessarily the best thing to do. Again, I think the, the key word here is diversification. So, you know, the, the longer the supply chains and the over-reliance on just one particular supply chain that is very long makes the industry vulnerable to that supply chain breaking. This is what we've learned in the past uh, few years, actually with both crises for different reasons. Diversify and therefore robustify the industry. That necessarily means that uh, some of the chains will have to be uh, uh, shorter. Uh, and they will be, you know, not relying on just one input, but on many different inputs, geographical inputs, in order to avoid uh, this, the, uh, the, uh, the sensitivities that we saw. I think I need to say, though, that uh, that would imply higher cost, um, because, you know, the process of globalization meant that we went where costs were uh, the lowest, and therefore we could produce in the most cost-effective uh, uh, way. Um, it's interesting to see that supply chains have actually not uh, suffered as a result of the two crises we've seen so far. But I think there is certainly a realization that we need to robustify the systems and diversify. My sense is that uh, some of the global supply chains will necessarily shorten. That will make the industry uh, more robust, but I think at higher cost. OK, Maria de Mertz is from the Brussels-based economic think tank Bruegel. Thank you so much for joining us on the programme and for taking so much time out just to answer those questions for us. And thanks also to you for watching. While uh, you're here on YouTube, why not check out some of our other videos, including our other business specials, of course, and also our series Business Beyond, which is always well worth a watch. Until next time, take care.